starting with Liam Cohen. I've got a little biography that he's given me here, and I've got <laughs> lots of other things to say about him. Uh, he's a creative and professional writing student. Yep, yeah, tip, that is true. Um, uh, here at Canterbury Christchurch, he started writing poetry at the age of 15. Um, since then, his passion for writing has blossomed, and he now writes all forms, which is just as well because we make them write from a lot of forms. Um, and he likes focusing on lifelike narratives. He lives in the seaside town of Deal. So yeah, I think we agree that the, the water is a there is something magical with his wife and dogs. His adopted hometown has been an inspiration for many of his works. And he's recently published an article on history of Deal for us on Kent Maps Online. So ooh, go and look at that afterwards. Um, besides writing, his interests include playing basketball, enjoying the beach, and being a good husband. And I would also like to say, yeah, a, a good colleague, because Lynn's coming up to the end of his degree now. It's always in the nicest way in the world. It's always really exciting when we can say that. <laughs> um, not because we want to get rid of them, but just because it's, 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 there is something actually really heartwarming about seeing them. In fact, they're still quite little. First year, um, and I'm lucky he's now taller than I am. It's great when they get to this point, and you think, Yeah, you're coming to the end of your degree, and you've really flourished as a writer. And so, Liam has written for us. He's also, I uh, won't preempt him because he's really going to talk about it, but he has done some wonderful work for us on Marguerite Poland's novel, A Sin of a Mission, and its connection with what <laughs> my colleague Ralph Norman calls global Canterbury. And I've been trying to work out with Liam whether it's the middle of the night where Marguerite is, but luckily apparently not because they're ahead of us. She's in South Africa. And hopefully we have her on the other end here. So um, welcome to Marguerite. No pressure, Liam, but don't feel that she's listening in the background. <laughs> um, but we are all very delighted to be here with you now. So firstly, I'll just uh, thank you everyone for coming. Obviously we've had some issues today, but thank you, Caroline, thank you. Michelle and thank you Kate for putting this all together because obviously you know Kent Maps is a new thing and we're really trying to push it so without you guys it wouldn't happen so quickly going here and also you'll see through here my constant change of hair so I sort of <laughs> I've only braided my hair just to show that I'm not actually bored so today as we talked about we're talking about Cantry Missions uh, my project uh, which included a podcast and an article but obviously particularly we're going to focus more on the article as you can see here, this is St. Augustine's Missionary College, which is now the King's School. Um, so we're, as you find with Canterbury, and as we've done research, there's a deep religious foundation within Canterbury. Also with St. Augustine's and then developing, so we've got missionary schools and so forth and so forth. So a little bit about me, so yes, I can grow hair. Um, that, that was optional. <laughs> yes, yeah, so a bit about um, head maps and me. So, as I kind of mentioned, the, the arc that we're going to talk about today is the sin of omission, um, which <laughs> tailors around the multiple things, but essentially around this book, Marguerite, uh, uh, Sin of Omission by Marguerite Poland, which I will go into detail further. And then the, my, my first article, uh, Deals Worn Ashore, which was part of a placement uh, project here on my last year. Um, so yeah, obviously this will be circulated, so you can feel free to scan it or you can research it as well. And then the Writing Comes Alive podcast, which again is all part of the Canterbury uh, Missions project, um, which I've done with the course lead. So obviously, as Cameron said, I'm a creative and professional writing student. So the course lead, Danny Rhodes, um, has a podcast and that's available on Spotify if you want to go listen to that. And there is a little snippet of this later. So I talked about this is this was like a project. Um, it was set as an assignment. Um, and this was this essentially was a assignment question. So I was thinking there. And the good thing about my degree per se is we get a lot of choice, we get a lot of options of what we want to do. But that also on the flip side, if you have that moment where you're like, panic, what am I gonna do? Because it's so broad. So essentially this was the question I was tasked with. So create a professional project demonstrating aspects of professional practice. So as you can imagine, yeah, there was lots of other options. So initially in our discussions, there was creating a website which, although I seemed useful at the time, where I am as a writer, it didn't, I didn't see I'd get as much benefit from that. Um, doing a podcast, which also I did go on to do, um, but my initial idea was to sort of educate people, particularly like family members that, they always ask me in doing a degree in humanities, so like, oh, would you want to go and do that? Or what can you actually do? 
so then sort of discussing that and then a lot of other students did created educational packs which i did think about um but then it was kind of again it was like how am i going to use this to progress me in the, in the future and not just tick a box to do the assignment so thankfully i come across this book and this was actually at the end of the the session i believe the first session carolyn presented me this opportunity and she was like oh i've got this i'm in touch with this uh, author marguerite Pylance, and she's very brief synopsis of the book um and yeah thankfully i was like yeah i'll do that and that's the first one so i'm just going to read you a quick snippet of the book again this will be so kind. If you want to go to purchase it, I do recommend um, doing so as well. Look at a quick snippet. So hopefully everyone can hear me online as well. If I can find a page. I did fold it up and now I can't find it. Great. This is why I test my reading skill as well. <laughs> Stephen had seemed frozen. He and his luggage were taken off. And he was borne along a tide of hurry and distractions almost forgotten in the bustle. And although the bishop and his party's words of encouragement and farewell had been warm and enthusiastic, he felt like dispatched goods, parceled off with relief. He had been unable to respond to the raise, to raise his eyes to grip his hand. I'll move on slightly. So this is so it's obviously the whole situation. This is when Stephen who is a South African young chap who we'll talk about, about later on, make more sense. First comes to England and uh, comes to Canterbury. Um, Stephen looked up start, startled. Do you speak English? Yes, sir. Then tell me, are you a chief or a prince like the other foreigners? Foreigners. Then that live in the foreigners building. Stephen was mystified. Last fellow I fetched from the ship was an Indian prince. Surprised he left a surprise he left is an elephant on them. Some luggage, real brother, taking him in. Taking him back didn't last. Stephen was silent. So essentially, we're going to talk about it a bit more. But what I found with my research, and re particularly researching anything to do with the British Empire, there's always two sides of the stories. So reading that now, it's like, well, how do you speak English? You know, were you a foreigner? So that could be quite abrupt. But often there's no malice in that, and particularly we're talking about one of the buildings here. So we talked about why I wanted to do this project, <clears throat> thinking ahead and along, being in the third year, obviously applying for jobs, I need to sort of think about how it's going to benefit my career. So the key I'm going to walk around a bit. So forgive me if you can't see my line, just because I want I want to point. So this is the main thing on my focus with all my whole degree, because as as Carolyn mentioned, I was a poet. Okay, and I literally chose this degree to expand my knowledge. So when I look back at it now, I think, oh, I've been writing for like nine years. It sounds like a lot, but you know, when I look at some of my peers, I'm writing the whole life. So I'm, I'm always actively trying to learn. To learn from industry professionals, Marguerite Poland has been published for over 40 years. So any information I get from there. And then learning, uh, you know, better my skills, earning new ones, um, developing existing professional relationships. So that would be also with a Kent map, so I've already written for with the deal article. Um, and then again with Danny, who I've worked in professional sense for the podcast, which is standard. Um, and yeah, improving my employability again, sort of links in the second one, Show and showcasing my talent. And it's always about having fun as well. Like sometimes, particularly with what writing after it, it can be a long process. So, you know, being not enjoying it, there's no point in doing it. Forgive me online if you're, I'm, I'm going to be walking around now because, yeah. So this is, I sort of mapped out the journey. This was started out. So first and foremost, I had to research Marguerite and obviously I found out that she's been published for 40 or over 40 years. So forgive me, Marguerite, perhaps showing your age and listening, but um, it's the credit to your illustrious career. Um, and then I made an initial contact. So again, this is always utilizing skills that I'd gained before. So obviously with the university, actually the foundation year prior and we learned about email etiquette and how to speak to different people as well because it's important to make that as you all know make that good first impression um yeah and then we organized the interview so again we kind of had technical difficulties so this we had teams and we went on to google meet but it's all skills about like problem solving um hosting uh, the video calls etc and then we conducted the interview from that interview so as you can see this is marguerite here I'm forever indebted for her for her kindness and you know 
fortunately she couldn't be here, but she's uh, doing some further work, um, and obviously in our South Africa. And so this book, A Sin of Omission, is stems based around this man, Reverend Stephen uh, Tutuku Mayakama. He was a student at the Missionary College. Um, so, and also Margaret herself has ties to the college because her great great grandfather was also a student. And obviously, through time, stories have been passed down. And then she, when she was 14 years old, she initially heard about Stephen. And then that sort of idea festered in her mind, but she didn't go, go to write on it. And then as she developed, she went on to write about it. So when we talk about Stephen in the book, it's not per se this Stephen. It's um, a chap called Stephen and Samane, but it's he's influenced by Stephen Marikama. So I'm just going to, hopefully this works. I'm just going to play you a short section of the podcast where uh, Marguerite talks about this. Well, in a funny way, I met Stephen as well, a young man who had a great influence on me, gentle, very intelligent, very conventional in a way because he wouldn't want to offend anybody or be in any way too confrontational with a deep sort of spiritual sense. And in some ways, he was the inspiration behind Stephen, as well, of course, the historical Stephen. And many years after I started writing the book, and very recently, I was sent a photograph of the real Stephen. I have never seen him before because there was no record of him. I tried desperately to find a photograph of him and would look at pictures, let's say, of synods and meetings of the clergy, and there would be black faces and I could never work out who Stephen was. And finally, I got this photograph. And here was this strong, wonderful young man with a lovely face. And from his letters, there's a kind of a, an insight and yet an anxiety, a sense of wanting to fit in and not being able to challenge, except when it became really important to say how he felt. Whereas with someone and his brother could challenge immediately, he was just one of those those kind of people. And I think it, it also came from the fact that in South Africa, because of our history, people are difficult and anxious to say black people how they feel or were because of the consequences. And the consequences were pretty horrific, but mostly in being ignored and not being heard. Okay, so let me move on because you don't need to hear my voice. Um, so as Marguerite touched upon there, the sort of the development and influence of Stephen from that. Um, I'm just going to go back quickly because it's quite important. Hopefully, we'll skip past. So Marguerite herself has done a lot, to, a lot of work, as you can see here. So this was a recent picture. So you're looking at March. So she's currently doing research in a village around sort of Stephen, she's developing that to so initially she was sort of apprehensive because this picture is quite important to her, her research. Um, but the, where she is there, that's um, initially where Stephen like, grew up and the, the court went to. So she's deeply connected within the community. <clears throat> so, move on. so naturally, this is one of my favorite things about doing this project. And again, learning from um, professionals is networking. You know, I really enjoyed it in my previous um, article with Dill. I felt like become Part of, part of the community as well. Like I said, I'm not from Deal, um, but Deal itself has quite a it's tight knit community. So I was able to meet local historians, you know, find out fantastic things about where I live that really helped to incorporate me into the um, the community. So obviously, with any project, I have to research. So I had literally no idea. I've just I just read the novel, um, and that's sort of. What's on, but I was like, where do I go from next? And that's also stemming from the podcast. I have this now. How am I going to develop this into the article? So I touched on, I identified some key areas um, to research. And then what I did is I sort of done like a mini like draft of an article, a small few hundred words. Um, and from that, I found out obviously that the, the St. Augustine's Mission College is now the King's School. So I literally just, I think I was working at the time, like on a sneakily, like when I have a job. 
And I literally called, contacted the King's School and I got in touch with a chap called Peter Henderson, who is the archivist um, for King's School. And luckily, we was, from then, we obviously we collaborated from there. And I was fortunate enough to have a tour around um, the King's School as well. So he's been very helpful. And then second was to, to speak to people who've already done research. So there was, there's not lots of research, but obviously the people that have done the research, so like Marguerite and um, Dr. Ralph Norman, who kind of mentioned before. Um, so basically just spoke to them and sort of see if I'm going on the right track. So I actually had a meeting with uh, Ralph Norman and said like, is this the right way? And he said, maybe consider stuff like that. Um, and yeah, and then third was to, like this was more later on, read archives personal experiences because I wanted that personal touch, particularly with, with Kent Maxwell, what we tried to do is there, there'd be lots of information about the topic, but the, per, the people that lived and breathed it would be able to give you a better so, account. So as I mentioned, when I was reading, this is what we call the foreigner block initially. So this was uh, <coughs> built to house in, uh, initially um, African students come over in the 1860s, I believe. Um, and Stephen would have been here. And it was because it was, it was commonly known as the foreigner block. And when I touched upon the British Empire, and you might think, well, that's a bit, it's a bit like rude, like maybe having them segregated. Um, but initially, the, the, the plan was behind it, and the people that were in charge at the time was to keep people who spoke the same language. So it's an easy settling period. So often at times when I, I find a research, because there's two sides of the story, not everything's with malice. So um, hindsight's obviously 2020. So maybe you, could, you probably wouldn't do that now. But um, yeah. Um, and yeah, this is Ralph. Uh, this was part of Ralph Norman's um, research, which he is in charge of the St. Augustine's uh, Foundation. And this was a really interesting piece I found from the archive. So as I mentioned, Marguerite's great grandfather um, was a student. This was him. So um, Alfred O'Brien. So he come to England, Canterbury in the late 19th century um, and he studied and then he returns back to South Africa. So a lot of times, particularly in international students, they return back to their native um, country. Um, and yeah, he returned back and went to be on, done multiple things, a scholar. But he, I believe he, um, he specialised in like linguistics and, and speeches and particularly people with speech impediments, which I found was interesting as well. So this is what I wanted to sort of achieve from the article. So particularly the first one, I wanted it to be more immersive because I found with my first article, although I'm really proud of it, because I was looking at mostly the marine culture, um, the marine culture in Deal, and that was spanning like over 300 years the marines were there. So there was a, it was a big like space that I had to cover. Um, so it's kind of just like, not listing, but it was like, this is this bit, this is this bit going on. So this, I wanted to get more immersive and that links into the second one of, obviously the the novel is foundation to this. So obviously Kent Max, we're like a non-fiction base, but I wanted to think about how could I incorporate a novel and the fiction aspect. So if you're going to read the article, which obviously I suggest, um, I do incorporate that as well. And then again, always as a touched on with the British Empire, providing an authentic um, representation of the history and particularly highlighting local heroes, because I know it's something that Kent Max and a lot of our new works are going on to do is highlighting is like black history as well. So most of the students that went to the college were, were English or for white English. Um, but the, the people that international students were had a big impact also as well. So just highlighting a few key aspects of the article now. So this chap here, um, Beresford Hope, that he initially brought the uh, the buildings of St. Augustine, which at the time was a brewery and a pub. It was called the Old Palace Pub, and it was at the time it was pretty run down. Um, as they say, MP of Mason, he was very, uh, he was a church guy, he was very, you know, but a, a strong believer. Um, and I believe he bought it, he bought the buildings before even coming to set, but you know, through Gosford Herving, hearing about this, as I was linking back to Canterbury has a deep um, sort of reputation and relationship with Christianity. Um, he sort of heard about it, he's like, yes, I'm interested. Um, and in partnerage with his friend, Edward Coleridge, they sort of founded this, um, and they sought out 
uh, a well-to-do architect called uh, Butterfield. So within the first 50 years, they sent out over 420 missionaries. This shows the, 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 the sort of the span of what they did. The world's close. So this was something that really interests me here. So again, I'm going to come around to it. Forgive me online. Um, the integration. So as you can see, this is the football team. So a lot of times, um, integration with the students uh, would, would be with sports. So as you can see here, Lawrence Walker, so this chap here, was a British Black Augustinian um, student. His heritage was Jamaican, similar to mine as well. Um, he was actually sent out to South Africa as well. But the, there was a keen emphasis on integration of international students. So often at times, international students were selected. So as, as I talked about with my reading of the novel, when the chap was asking, like, are you a prince, are you a chief? Often at times, international students were selected. So they'd be like, a chief of a Corsa tribe or a chief of a, or a prince of that. Um, and obviously at the time, the integration wouldn't be uh, that common. So the first um, British black footballer uh, before this, so obviously Lawrence went on to captain the team this last year, was only 11 years prior. So it's still sort of the college was leaps and bounds ahead of in terms of inclusivity. And also as well, it was they offered world-class education. So I'm just going to quickly read this. This was directly a direct quote from one of the students. So I shall never regret the step I took, as I firmly believe that at Oxford or Cambridge, my missionary zeal would have so-called and and other ties would have taken such a hold of me. So from my research, there was a lot of uh, emphasis of sort of the rivaling and people would choose to come here, you know, travel a long way and to come here and also the key thing about discipline, which uh, Henry Bailey awarded on that award at the time, <coughs> you know, one might say that was quite restricted, but that was just because when they was going to go on to do their roles as missionaries, they needed sort of this guidance and um, dedication to their craft. But I'm going to speed up a little bit because no problem. And this is another bit as well, which from my discussions with Marguerite, um, she told me about. So this is a really cool, cool part of, of the history. So obviously, as you mentioned, King's, the King's School um, owns the building. Obviously, it's no longer a, a St. Augustine's, but they've maintained the history um, of the college with, with the lower chapel. So as you can see here, this is um, Marguerite's great grandfather Branson. And this is in the lower chapel. So in the whole lower chapel, I have the names of the alumni carved into the wall. And then where they were sent out to Grahamstone, so that's um, South Africa. And then when they arrived and then when they passed away. So I think that's a really good touch as well. That they probably took. I'm just going to speed through here, so we'll talk about that. So sort of what I learned from the, the article, again, the religious foundations, local black history as well, which I think is really important. I was talking to one of our students about that in Kent. And I know Kent Maps wants to promote that a bit and have ideas, but we'll talk about that later because I know I'm slightly running over. Um, and again, yes, yeah, all, with all my research, it's just form my own opinion, because I've said there's, there's no right or wrong. And I remember my mum growing up, she said, history is always written by the victor. That's why the benefit of getting um, the personal touch of people who actually live there, because we can do all this research, but also I'm never going to truly know what it's like to be a student there. So from getting that personal account, um, I can do that. And to prepare co and contrast text effectively, and again, that's the integration of both the fiction and the non-fiction as well. So, first of all, so thank you, thank you everyone for coming from all for what you've done today. If you want to connect with me, you can connect me at uh, X and LinkedIn as well. And um, yeah, do re have a read of the articles, have a listen to the podcast, and if any feedback, I greatly appreciate it. Thank you.